been so good to me. If he never does another thing, he's already done more than I'm worthy of. I don't need another reason. All that is in me, I've got to praise you now. God bless you and thank you for tuning in tonight for our hour of power. God has been good to all of us during the course of this day. Our God is a good God and our God is worthy to be praised. He brought us along the day to this point where we can come together right now and study the Word of God and see what God is saying to us. We have entered into Black History Month and uh, that is always a plus, that is always a good thing. Um, but it ought not dictate how we understand the Bible. We should be understanding, understanding the Bible from a proper interpretation not just in February, but throughout the entire year. And so, you know, a lot of times in February, we turn our attention, the black church, the black community, turns its attention on the history of our people. And in church, we tie that in to the biblical witness. Uh, but if it's tied into the biblical witness in February, then it should be throughout the course of the year. It should be a new way of how we begin to understand the divinely inspired written word of God. And we're going to get into uh, our Bible study, but will you pray with me just now? Father, we thank you and we praise you. We glorify you and we magnify you. We thank you for allowing us to come to this portion of our day. We thank you, God, for bringing us safely throughout the course of the day, despite the challenges the upsets, despite the letdowns and the good times, the high water marks of our day, we have come to this place to say thank you. Open up our minds and our hearts as we seek to understand your word and what you have to say to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to um, look at the book of Daniel and in your devotional time, I want you to read the first four chapters of the book of Daniel. And in those first four chapters, it, it captures, it chronicles part of the crisis of the Hebrew people during the Babylonian captivity. You Bible readers know about the Babylonian captivity when Nebuchadnezzar raided Israel and took the cream of the crop, the best of the best. Uh, he took the intelligentsia, he took the business people, he took the musicians, he took the best of the best, the cream of the crop. He left the poor, the marginalized, he left all of them behind in Israel he just took the high class, the upper crust. And the reason he did that is because the Babylonian culture had been slumping. It was going downhill. And Nebuchadnezzar needed an infusion of a new culture with new energy, new idea, new ideas. And he was attracted to the Babylonian culture. It was a bustling culture, a thriving culture. Uh, it was a wonderful culture. And Nebuchadnezzar said, if we can just take the leaders of the, Babylon, the, the Israelite culture and infuse them by force into the Babylonian culture, then I can snap Babylonian culture out of its slump. And so they went to Israel and they took the best of the best forced them into exile in Babylon. Told them, y'all have free reign of the country, you just can't leave. Musicians, play your instruments, but do it in Babylon. Philosophers, do your philosophical work, but do it in Babylon. Religionists, engage in your religion, 
bring the tenets of your religion, but direct your religious affections and devotion to our gods. You know, uh, bring your business savvy from Israel to Babylon and execute business in Babylon the way you did it in Israel so that our culture can be blessed and blossom and grow uh, the way yours have grown in Israel. So they got the best of the best. And when they got the best of the best, there is the best of the best of the best. And they took some of the young men who were from um, esteemed families in Israel who were a part of the aristocracy of Israel. And they took those boys, those young men, the ones that they believed were smart. And you can read the, the book of Daniel. It'll tell you the criterion that the Babylonian government used to select young men to put them in an apprenticeship program for three years. They had to be smart. They had to have high IQs. They had to be uh, well-versed and open to learning about Babylonian culture. They had to be able to comprehend it. They had to have a high level of intellect. And then they had to be young. They had to be strong. They had to be good looking. They had to be spiritual. They had to be young men of depth. And so they tested these young men to find out which ones that they would use. And so they had cohorts every year. They would find these great young men. And in this particular cohort, there were four young men that they, that they selected. Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, whose names were changed to Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These four young men were brought from Israel and they were put in Babylon and they were some of the young men who were selected to be a part of this, of this apprenticeship program. And what this apprenticeship program was supposed to have done was to acculturate them into Babylonian culture. They wanted to weed out, strain out all that they had learned growing up in Israel, wanted to weed out their Hebrew culture take away from them their God. Uh, they wanted to root out some of the Hebrew traditions that they had become accustomed to and replace them with Babylonian tradition, what I call Babylonianism. Wanted to immerse these young men into that culture. They wanted them to keep your gifts. Now you are gifted young men and you have something to offer the Babylonian culture. We want you to keep your gift, but all of that other Hebrew stuff, we want to sort of sift all of that out of you. Uh, your devotion to your God. We, we, we need, we, we, if you want to be devoted to a God, take that same devotion and direct it to our gods. You know, you have value. You are smart. You are brilliant. You got it going on, but all of your ethnicity, all that ethnic stuff, y'all just leave that. Come acculturate into Babylonian culture and do your thing so that we can lift the entire Babylonian uh, uh, experience. We want to lift it because it's slumping. And so they found four guys in this particular cohort. There were many others in the cohort, but there were four standouts, uh, Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, um, four standouts. And we know them as the Hebrew boys. And so they put them in this, this acculturation program into this apprenticeship program to teach them about Babylonian culture. Really, it was to brainwash them so that, so that they can uh, reject and refute their culture and become Babylonians. You know, they, they, they wanted the end result, the outcomes. 
that these young men will come out of this apprenticeship program saying, I am not Hebrew, I am Babylonian. Forget about my ethnicity, I am a patriot of Babylon. I'm a Babylonian. That was the outcome that Nebuchadnezzar wanted to have from these Hebrew boys. And so they put them in this acculturation program. And one of the things that they did immediately was to change their names. See, that's what the enemy wants to do. Take away from you what God has given you and replace it with what he wants you to have and wants you to recognize what he has given you as God given. So we're going to take your names and we're going to give you the names we want you to have. And in this Babylonian culture, names meant everything as well as in the Hebrew culture, names meant everything. When you get an opportunity, run a reference on names in the Bible and names reflected the character, the dignity of the person who bore that name. Names meant everything. Daniel, name, the name Daniel, the name his parents gave him was Daniel. But Nebuchadnezzar in that Babylonian culture changed his name to Belteshazzar. Because if you're going to operate in this culture, we have to name you. And if we name you, then we believe we can control you. Because the name Daniel's parents gave him means God is my judge. And that's powerful. It was a constant reminder to Daniel that nobody is in the position to judge me but God. I mean, can you imagine walking through life knowing that that's the meaning of your name? That nobody has the authority or the power to judge you except God? So that when people start judging you and saying things about you, it rolls off your back like water. Because nobody has the authority or is in the position to judge you except God. And the reason is, you just don't have the whole story about anybody's situation. So none of us are really in the position to judge anybody unless we have the whole story. And even when we do have the whole story, we always have biases, our own personal biases that we read into the story. Nobody is in the position to judge anybody. We don't know the whole story. As a matter of fact, even in the court of law, man's law, a judge doesn't render a verdict or a judgment until the judge has all of the evidence, both sides of the story, the back story, the front story, until he has all of the evidence, then that judge is in the position to render a verdict or to render a judgment. But in most situations in life, we only see parts and bits and pieces of people's story. And then we want to judge that person based upon the limited amount of information we have about the story. That's why we keep getting it wrong. We just keep getting it wrong. And then we have to eat crow later on. Oh, I didn't know that what was going on. I wouldn't have said that had I known. Well, you don't know everything. And even with what little bit you have known, the added information that you have gotten, you still don't know it all. And so you're still not in the position to judge anybody. And so Daniel's name meant God is my judge because God is the only one that's in the position to judge any of us. But when he got to Babylon, they stripped the brother of his name, Daniel, and gave him Belteshazzar. And that means God protect the king. 
the name no longer reflected anything about Daniel, but his name Belteshazzar is now projected towards God protecting the king. It's no longer about me. It's about somebody else. My name no longer reflects the good in me. But my name has become now a reflection of what the Babylonians want of me. God protect the king. My name means nothing to me anymore. But my name has become a projection to what they would call patriotism. God protect the king. That's one of the things that the enemy does, renames you, gives you a name that reflects his best interests. Not yours, but his. Hananiah, his name means God gives graciously. But Hananiah's name was changed to Shadrach. Now, Hananiah means the Lord gives graciously. Can you imagine having that name? Every time somebody calls that name, it reminds you that you have a gracious, generous God. That I don't have to worry about what's going to happen. I don't have to worry about provisions because the mere mention of my name is a reminder that I have a God who is gracious towards me, towards us, toward our community. And even when I'm experiencing lack in my life, does not negate the reality that the God we serve is gracious. That can give me hope that when I'm experiencing lack in my life, knowing that I serve a generous God, I recognize that it's only going to be a matter of time before my gracious God begin to move on my behalf. That was Hananiah's name, but when he got to Babylon, they changed his name to Shadrach, which means little friend of the king. You see where this is going now. Their names are no longer a reflection of who they are based upon their Hebrew culture, but their names now reflect devotion to the king, the man that's in charge of the empire. Little friend of the king. You've been demoted by virtue of your name. Your name was God, uh, Hananiah, which is God is generous or the Lord gives generously. And now you've received a demotion in your name by being attached with Shadrach, which means little friend of the king. Take your name. And then you have Michel. That is, who is like God? That was his name. That's the name that his parents gave him. Michel. Who is like God? That is, I'm, I'm made in his image. After his likeness. What does that do to our esteem? What does that do to our self-image? When I hear on a daily basis that you are like God. You are in God's image. You are after God's likeness. Not only does that give me esteem, but it also calls me into accountability because I can't live any kind of way and bear that name. Who is like God? I can't live down here with that name. Who is like God? I got to raise my game to get it to the level where it matches my name. Who is like God? But they took Meshach and gave him Meshach, which means who is Aku? Who is Aku? That's what his name means, uh, Meshach. It means who is Aku? And Aku is 
a Babylonian God that few people even worshiped. And his name indicates he is one of the least God, the lower gods. Who is Aku? And, and, and some writers suggest that the name Aku literally means meaningless. It has no meaning. It's a God that has no meaning. Very few, if any, even worship him. It's meaningless. Azariah. And Azariah means the help of God. That was his given name. Azariah, help of God. That is, his very name meant. When I go throughout my day, I know I have God's help. Imagine that. Every time somebody calls your name, Azariah, it means help of God, that I have God's help in everything that I do. Can you imagine how big that can make me dream? You know, you dream big when you know your God has got your back. There is nothing you cannot do. There is nothing you cannot achieve. If you can dream it, you can be it. Because I have the help of God. That's Azariah's name. He's got the help of God. Can you imagine what that did to his esteem? When somebody tried to tell him, you can't do it, you can't accomplish it, you can't make it happen. His brother, oh, my very name indicates that I've got God's help. All of my help comes from the Lord. I look to the hills from which cometh my help, and I recognize all of my help come from the Lord. His name indicated that. But when he got to Babylon, they took Azariah's name and named him Abednego, which means slave of Nebo. What a demotion. Took my name and gave me Abednego, which means slave of Nebo. How degrading. You know, how demeaning, how negating. I'm going to give you these names. And that's who the Babylonians, and, and those were the names that the Babylonians refer to them. Forget about your name. Forget about your ethnicity. Forget about where you came from. Forget about your ancestors. Forget about your forefathers. Forget about your foremothers. Forget about your gods. Forget about your history. Forget about your heritage. You're one of us now. And we will call you what we want you to be. Forget about your name. Now, we're taking you through this acculturation program. And so when you come out on the other side of this, of this program that we're putting you through for three and a half years, when we call you Abednego, you answer. When we call you Belteshazzar, you answer. When we call you Shadrach and Meshach, you answer. Because we're brainwashing you. You're going to respond to who we want you to be. And that's what happens in cultures. And they thought they had these brothers. They thought they had them. Because they had most of them. When you come through this acculturation program, they got you. Because what they did was, after you came out of the acculturation program, if you did well, if you excelled in the program, what they did was they gave you big jobs in the government that paid good money. You were on top. You were a part of the ruling class now, even though they recognize you're still a minority. You ain't really one of us. You got a good job. You make good money. You live comfortably, but you still ain't one of us. And we want you to remember that. We named you. We put you where you are, and we want you to remember that and understand it. Now, you can come in here and act an uppity if you want to, 
Understand, we can look at you and tell that you are not one of us. And so they got these great jobs in the government. They were literally advisors to the king. They advised the king. And one time Nebuchadnezzar went to sleep and he had a disturbing dream, beloved. Very disturbing dream. And he needed his advisors, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, Belteshazzar, Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, Daniel, these boys, they were a part of the king's advisory council. The king has this dream and he needs someone to interpret the dream for him. And he sends the word out to all of his wise men, including the Hebrew boys who were on the staff now. They went through the acculturation program. They have responsibilities to the king now. Sent him through that program. And the king put the word out, I need my dream interpreted. And if you can interpret my dream, first of all, you need to tell me what my dream was. You said you're in touch with God. You said you have a relationship with God. Now, if you have that relationship with God, if you're that close with God, then God can tell you not only what I dreamed, but he can also uh, reveal to you the meaning of my dream. And so that was the word. And so the wise men came together and said, King, you've got to at least tell us what the dream is. Nebuchadnezzar said, I'm not telling you what the dream is. You tell me what my dream was and you interpret my dream for me. They told him, King, that can't be done. So the king said, well, I'm putting all of y'all to death. And the first person they went and got was Daniel. They grabbed Daniel and they're taking Daniel to his death. Daniel walks past his brothers, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he says to those brothers, hey, man, pray for me. I'm on my way to the king, and you know what the punishment is if I can't reveal to him what his dream was and the meaning of the dream. And so the brothers went in prayer for Daniel. And when Daniel gets to the king, God had revealed to Daniel what that dream was. Daniel reveals to the king, and when Daniel reveals the dream to the king, the king fell down and worshiped Daniel and his God and said to Daniel, I'm giving you a promotion. Guess what Daniel said? Good king, but I have a request. I got three brothers who are here with me. They're going to have to roll with me. I'm not leaving my brothers behind. I'm taking my brothers with me to the next level. He never forgot who he was. Never forgot. Can you imagine if we had that type of mentality towards one another? Once we get to another level, don't forget the people you came up with. Don't leave behind folk you came up with. Don't forget about where you came from. And I see that happening way too much in our society, in our community, we tend to forget where we came from. And when we get elevated to another level, we forget about the people from whom we came. Daniel said, I'm about to be promoted. And I want to take my brothers with me. He took his brothers with him. But here's the other side of that. His brothers were able to handle the level that Daniel took them to. See, there are some people who can't handle the next level. There are some people who are just hangers on and will pull you down and will impede your progress because the, the, the purpose of progress is to get to a level where you can be a blessing to everybody around you. That's the purpose of progress. That's the purpose of success. Not just so you can bling bling, not so just you can drive good and live good, but the purpose of success is for you to get to a level where you can bless and help 
and uplift people who historically have been held down and kept back. That's what true success is all about. Spare me from people, and there are only a few, who get to the next level and won't do anything for anybody. It's all about themselves. It's a few. And you know, when you look at our celebrities, our athletes and all of that, our millionaires in, in our community, a lot of people say they're not doing anything. That's not true. It doesn't get broadcast what they're doing, but they're doing major things. And I don't mean just going around handing out $20 bill. No, major stuff. Lifting communities, opening schools. LeBron James has a school, a very successful school. Oprah Winfrey opened schools. And I just read about Serena Williams. She's somewhere over in Africa somewhere opening schools for training, academic centers. You've got athletes that you've never heard of doing big things in our community. Jalen Rose was on television and everybody was had all of this, uh, this, all of this praise for LeBron James opening school. Jalen Rose said, I did that 15 years ago. And he had. So you got brothers and sisters in our community, millionaires who are athletes and business people and academics, they're doing great things in our community. It just doesn't get broadcast all the time. But there are a few who it's not about anybody but themselves. And more of us. And look, you don't have to wait until you become a millionaire because most of us will not become millionaires. But what you have, you can use to lift somebody up. What little you have, what little knowledge you have, what little time you have, what little skills you may have, how come you can't invest that to lift others up? And you have a lot of people finger pointing. Look at that person, look at that person. He got all that money, he got all this, and he ain't doing nothing for the community. But the question is, what are you doing with what little you have? How about that? What are you doing? to lift up others in your community. We're gonna continue with this on next week um, uh, because this is a stimulating conversation because these brothers in this text, their experience matches ours here in America. I mean, it's a mirror image. They match our experience. And so when we begin to understand the word of God the way it was intended for us to understand it, then we'll see its relevancy even more clearly and more profound in our own lives. We're going to stop right here. We'll continue tomorrow, um, uh, continue next week with the rest of the story. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we bless you. We praise your holy name. We love you here tonight. And God, we pray that your word has gone forth and that somebody was enlightened, somebody was helped. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. If you're listening to me tonight and you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and your personal Savior, we want to extend to you that opportunity, extend to you that privilege that you might meet Christ and that you might be saved. If you're here tonight and you're listening to me tonight, we encourage you to accept Christ and be saved. It's easy. Romans 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. In the book of Acts, it said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Salvation is easy. And the reason it's easy is because Christ made it easy out on Calvary. If you're listening to me tonight and you're not saved and you want to be a part of of the body of Christ. Pray this prayer with me, Lord Jesus. I believe you died on Calvary. I believe God raised you from the dead. I confess with my mouth that God has resurrected you and I believe you as Lord of my life. Will you come into my life for the forgiveness of my sins? If you prayed that prayer, you're saved. God bless you and welcome to the family of Christ. You need a church home, we recommend Mount Carmel. You can go to our website, mountcarmelindy.org, click on the link, and that'll walk you through 
and send us an email indicating that you want to be a part of the Mount Carmel Church and our team will reach out to you and walk you through the onboarding process. And there you have it, you're a part of the Mount Carmel Church family. I would love to be your pastor and the members of Mount Carmel would love to come alongside and to be a system of support as you grow and mature in Christ. Amen. If you have not had the opportunity this week to support uh, the church with your resources, you can do so. You can give on our Secure Give app. You can give um, through our website, mountcarmelindy.org, uh, and you can click on the link. It'll walk you through uh, the, the prompt so that you can give. Uh, you can give through, the, through texting. The number's on your screen. You can text that number in, the amount you want to give, and text give, and we'll receive it. Or you can mail it to us. The address is also on the screen, Mount Carmel Church, 9610 East 42nd Street, Indianapolis, Indiana, 46235. Uh, amen. And we pray that you will send it so that we can use it to the glory of God for the uplift of our community. Let's look to the Lord to be dismissed. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the communion of the Holy Ghost and the love of God, rest, rule, and abide with each and every one of us, henceforth now and forever. God bless you and good night.